everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Dana Killian is an amazing woman. She's the author of Where the Shadows Dance. The book is a brutally honest account of her journey as her husband descended into alcoholism and the betrayals that followed. The book is about coming to terms with the grief of infidelity, and it's ultimately a story of one woman's courage to leave a life that was no longer working and to find a path of her own. Please welcome Dana Killian to Bump in the Road. Dana, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Hi there. I am Dana Killian. I am someone who experienced a long-term alcoholic marriage, and I am writing about that experience. Um, It is the story of people who rarely tell our stories, the ways in which the loved ones, those of us that are on sidelines, the sober partners, we have become collateral damage in someone else's self-destruction. And I'm writing about my experience as a way to not only heal myself, but I think that these conversations need, these situations, these life experiences need to be shared because it's part of the healing process. It is part of seeing ourselves in someone else's story. It is a process of understanding that we can indeed heal, but healing requires discussing. Healing requires sharing these experiences that we just don't choose to talk about often. Tell us a little bit about your specific story, because it had a lot of ups and downs, and it took quite a period of time for everything to really evolve. It did. Um, This was a long-term marriage. It took me a number of years before I understood that my former husband was an alcoholic. He was very high functioning and I didn't know a lot about addiction. So as we processed through this, addiction is not linear. And so there is this process of understanding, Ooh, I think something's going on, but is it heavy drinking? Is it my differences in opinion, my differences in lifestyle? Am I reacting to something and projecting my own thoughts onto his behavior? So it did, it took me quite a while to understand that addiction was indeed the problem. Like most people who are in addictive relationships, this is a discovery. This is a learning. And we're having ongoing conversations with our partners. What's going on here? Something seems off. You're drinking a lot. What's happening? My particular situation, because my partner was such a high-functioning alcoholic, it wasn't the obvious signs. He wasn't stumbling and slurring and being obnoxious in the ways that we typically think of as addiction. It was difficult for me to see it. Eventually, over time, as we continue to have these conversations, the cue, the key there for me was he would always react positively in in terms of pos- by positive i mean yes of course i will i will modify my behavior i'm just a little stressed there were always excuses but there was always modification as well but the problem came in because it just kept coming back and the more i talked about it the more he moved into secretive drinking And secretive drinking, the lying about whether he had been drinking, was really the sign to me that addiction was part of the problem. And that takes you through a whole new path. And that leads to a whole new range of, what are we going to do about this? How do I deal with the shifts in my relationship? How do I protect the man I love? How do I protect my children? whole new sets of fears come into this because 
when it's secret, there's something going on and you start worrying about things like, will my children be safe in the car? And that just puts this whole new slant on not only your relationship, but your fears about what you need to do as the sober partner to help this man you love, this person you love, find healing and come to terms with what you see as the potential fears. Because as sober partners, we start to see all of the things that could go wrong. And our partner doesn't see that yet because they haven't yet faced the reality of addiction. That takes process. That takes, in my case, years. It In, in our case, years. Because it's just not a linear process. You, you, you take the two steps forward and three or four steps backwards. Each, each moment of, we got to deal with this, was met in the way I would expect any reasonable partner to meet it with, yes, I will go see a therapist. Yes, I will moderate my drinking. But it never solved the problem because he hadn't truly internalized this as addiction and didn't want to give it up. What sort of behavioral changes did you see in your ex-husband? The the primary behavioral changes were more the secretive drinking. I didn't see all the classic things. He wasn't belligerent. He wasn't being obnoxious. He Nobody saw his drinking as problematic other than me because I'm the one, you know, waking up next to him at three in the morning and smelling the stench of the stale alcohol when I had not seen him drinking at all. It was the secretiveness of it. It was the, in some cases, blatant lying. I can smell the booze on your breath. How do you stand there and tell me you haven't? It was the, yeah, I had a drink when you clearly had had a lot more. It was that kind of behavior. And the more I pushed, the more I got concerned, and that's what we do as, as the loved one, we up the ante on our, our pressure, our how do I help this person I love deal with their problem because it is a family problem now. It is not just his issue. It is our issue as a marriage, our issue as a family. And so the more I pushed, the more I held him to the fire a little bit on getting help, dealing with the problem, the more secretive the drinking became. There was a moment in time where I realized he had been drinking straight from the bottle of vodka. And it was just a horrifying moment for me because he was doing this while I was upstairs putting our children to bed. That's what he was doing, sneaking in there, drinking straight out of the bottle so I wouldn't see the dirty glasses, so I wouldn't No, I wouldn't see him with alcohol. And then to be in this position as the loved one, to feel that you've got to monitor the behavior. We become the little booze police. And it's just, it's a horrendous feeling to be treating your partner like a child when, but they are indeed behaving like a child or like a teenager trying to get away with something. The lying and the the secrets around it were the biggest issue for me. Well, there was also betrayal, um, which is a a significant issue. Um, Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, There were a couple of more classic incidents along the way. There was one, um, he did get a DUI at one point, um, and that was an issue. But again, there were ways in which he minimized because he was out of state, did not lose his driver's license. There was a way around it. He was going to condition himself. He was he was going to explain away and rationalize that behavior. But the betrayal part, yeah, that, that entered in as well. Um, my first awareness of his sexual behavior, his infidelity, was an incident where he was working out of state and 
was not available by phone at our normal phone conversations. I, when I saw him over the weekend, I asked him about it, and he did actually admit. Um, he said, no, at first, no, I'm not having an affair. And I felt the urge for some reason to say, have you ever? And I was very specific about my question. I don't know why. There was just some instinct in me that said, this is a man who has found ways to talk around issues, to answer questions where part of the truth is there, but not all of it. So my question to him was, have you ever had sex of any kind with anyone other than me during our marriage? And what he admitted to at that point was a drunken one-night incident on a business trip. That turned out to be, yes, true, but it also, I later found out that that was simply one incident that he chose that he thought was going to be the most palatable, if you will, the most forgivable of the incidents that I later learned of. Um, It was devastating to me at the time, but as someone who's many years into the addiction cycle at that point, I understood that there was a connection between, excuse me, between the, um, sexual behavior in that moment, and alcohol consumption. I did not have any clue what the reality would later, I would later discover. And what I'll, what I'll say about that right now is that eventually um, he did go to rehab. He did go to an inpatient rehab facility when I was at the point of, I'm done, I'm leaving there had been therapy prior. There had been other attempts to get sober, but there had never been willingness to go to AA. There had never been willingness to go to rehab. I reached my breaking point or what I thought was my breaking point. And he did go to a rehab center. Unfortunately, while he was there, one of the things that I learned was that the sexual incident that I knew of was simply one of God knows how many and that he had been promiscuous, to be blunt, uh, throughout our marriage. And that threw a whole nother, um, another ugly brokenness into our situation. I think betrayal fundamentally changes a relationship. You wrote, betrayal never leaves you rising to the surface whether you want it or not. It has a life of its own and inserts itself when the skin of our hearts is thin and easily damaged. Whoa, that's, that, that is just so spot on. I mean, it's like somebody puts a knife in you, they turn it, and that's not enough. They have to plunge it in just a little deeper. <laughs> it's kind of funny because I just got chills myself as you read my words, <laughs> thinking back to how raw and painful that is. It's part of, part of addiction is the ability, the extreme ability to compartmentalize your behavior. Part of mental health, I mean, I'm talking addiction of any kind. There is an, the compartmentalization that addicts do to convince themselves they are not that bad Whatever they're going through, whatever they're doing, it's not that bad. It's not going to really hurt people around them because they can contain it. And I think that his sexual behavior was really part of this compartmentalization. Um, there's so much to talk about on, on kind of how that processing, how, for me, over time, how that processing of the whys, how do you live with someone and be that shocked by the secret behavior? There's so much in the experience of betrayal that I think the the perpetrator, (laughs) for lack of a better word, 
doesn't really understand how it just grips your heart. It grips not just your relationship with this person, what did it ever mean, but it, it attacks it attacks us at our core because it's the betrayal changes who we thought we were. It causes us to question, what kind of an idiot am I that I didn't see or I didn't know or I'm choosing to try to work through this? There's so much about our self-worth that gets roped into this mix of someone else's problem. I have thought of myself and described myself as the collateral damage in my former husband's self-destruction. And this betrayal is an example of that. He chose this behavior because he is broken. And it, in turn, wasn't about me, but it broke me. And it does not leave you because it shifts your ability to trust not only yourself and others who might come into your life. How do you ever look at yourself again? How do you ever look at someone else again who you thought to be one thing when they have had this secret life? It's such a devastating, thoroughly consuming act. It just changes you. And our struggle is, what do we do with that now? Well, it attacks your base of truth, of reality. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, everything you thought that was real is not. Exactly. How in the world do you process that? Yeah. Well, you're questioning your marriage. Aside from our, the addiction, I thought I had a pretty fantastic marriage. I thought I had a pretty fantastic life. And yes, part of that was my own compartmentalization, but addiction is part of an illness and we have to approach it not as this is a horrible person. We approach this, I think we should, as if this is an amazing person who happens to have a problem, happens to have a mental health problem that they're not dealing with. And that is what his addiction was and that is what his sexual behavior was. But it's impossible for his mental illness, his unaddressed mental health problems, not to affect me. And my job has become making sure that whatever, men whatever mental health issues he has, whatever mental health issues have been thrust on me as a result of his behavior, the betrayals, the trust, the lack of trust. I have to work toward not being damaged. Changed, yes, that's impossible not to be. But I can't allow that damage to become my damage too. And that's my journey right now. If you could describe yourself when you were married, like what your identity was then and what it is now, what would you... How would you, what would you say and how would you contrast the two? Mm. I would say that something has never changed about me is my capacity for empathy, my ability to see multiple sides of an issue. I can place myself in someone else's shoes. I have that. I have always had that. And that's part of what helped me deal with his addiction. Not only during the marriage, but it's also helped me deal with the addiction and the ugly behavior after. Because that empathy and compassion for a human being experiencing something difficult is just part of who I am. But part of who I was in the marriage that has changed is during the marriage, I was always pretty quiet. I was the good little girl. I was the person who was protecting the loyalty that I felt for this man. I was protecting our secret, in part because I viewed it as marital loyalty, but also I knew that discussing these things is difficult. 
discussing these things is often something you can't go back on in a relationship. The addict does not want their ugly side exposed because they don't want to face it. And I kept quiet about that. That was my childhood upbringing. The good Midwestern quiet girl doing what she's supposed to do. What the experience has taught me is that if I stay that quiet little girl or the quiet grown-up woman now, I can't heal. I will. Al- I would allow that that damage in him to become and to stay damage in me. Yes, that was an awful experience. I don't wish it on anyone. But by taking the experience that I had, using the experience to not only forgive him, to understand, I don't want to live with it, but I don't have to hate him. I don't have to feel vindictive and vengeful. By finding a place of compassion for him, I'm finding a place of compassion for me. And I am healing in a different way by using that empathy and compassion for myself and by speaking about things that I could not speak about. I feel stronger in who I am today. I like myself a whole hell of a lot more today than I ever did. And it is because I found found a way to use this awful experience for something good. I'm sharing my story, not only for my own healing, but I'm sharing my story so that other people who have not yet found their voice can relate, can recognize, can see that healing is possible, that can maybe find a little courage to share their stories too, because finding a way to get this ugliness out of your head and out of your heart is essential to healing. And so as much as I wish it hadn't happened and that I was still in the marriage that I wanted to have, it's given me an incredible gift and I wouldn't give that back for anything because I like myself an awful lot now, a lot more than I ever did. I have a confidence in who I am and a respect for who I am that I didn't have before. I think when we're all faced with an illusion, an illusion of a marriage, of a relationship, of where we stand in the world, whatever it is, and that's broken, it's very hard to come back from. But it also offers opportunity. And that opportunity is, as you're saying, to really go within and to look at yourself, and to find the things that you like about yourself, which maybe you've been hiding. I've certainly found myself thinking, and probably even said to him over the years, how do you look yourself in the mirror? How did you look yourself in the mirror? You knew what you were doing, and you were willing to risk everything that you had. You are really willing to risk my life, the person that you love. How do you look yourself in the mirror and do that? And I've thought about that a lot because I, too, have to be the one that looks myself in the mirror about the reality of what the relationship might have been that I wanted it to be and wasn't, or my own compartmentalization about the parts of the relationship that were not perhaps real or were hidden from me. We spend a lot of time after betrayal kind of kicking ourselves with what should I have known? What should I have seen? Second guessing ourselves. And while we all, it's a natural thing to do it, staying stuck in that is not a helpful place either. So I have to get to the place of looking myself in the mirror and making the decision What do I believe true about the marriage? Did I love this man deeply? Absolutely. Did he love me? Absolutely. But I now have qualifiers on his love. He loved me to the extent he is capable of. And so I have to look at that in the mirror. And I'm not going to discard what I felt because what I felt and saw was real. There were just other parts that perhaps I didn't see fully. 
and I have to, you know, I have to reconcile the behavior with what I felt. And that's part of my own looking myself in the mirror because there is, I think, you know, we can't ever be inside someone else's head. And we all have ideas of what our relationship is. And our partner may have a different idea. My situation is perhaps more extreme than most, thank (laughs) goodness. But there is a reality there of what my experience is, what is his experience, and how do I reconcile the two? I think finding love in the relationship in retrospect is both wise and kind, because I think often love is there. And as you say, different people may be seeing different things. But if you invalidate the love that you felt, then what was your experience? Was it, you know, was it just totally vapid, constructed, meaningless? And I, I think that, I don't think that's where you, that's where I'll say you were, but that's where any of us are when we experience betrayal. There are certain elements of our experience that have to be real for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, Does that I make do. Sense? Oh, absolutely. I do remember, and, and I probably said this in the book too, like what of my life has been real is everything that I've experienced over 25 years Mm-hmm. just this fantasy. But I couldn't sit with that. That didn't feel right to me either. I mean, I'm I'm not a stupid woman. I'm not a fool. I feel like a fool, felt like a fool at times. But my experience can't have been entirely a fantasy as well. I felt love. I adored this man. And I felt that back from him. So grappling with the inconsistencies, because obviously serial cheating is not an expression of love. And he would not have viewed that as an expression of love if I had been the one to betray him. And and so that, that weird inconsistency is is a struggle to deal with. What is real? What isn't? And all we can do is try to put some perspective on what might have been real for him. But it's more important that we understand what is real for us. I can't negate 25 years of love for this man. My love was real. What I felt from from him was real. It just wasn't quite what I thought. Or I projected that some of the aspects of my love were part of his when they weren't there because he just didn't love himself. So therefore, he couldn't love me as deeply as I loved him. But it is, yes, it's something It's something so difficult to grapple with. But when we are betrayed, if we don't grapple with that, then we're going to be sitting with hate, hate for ourselves and, and feeling bad that we have not, that we have lied to ourselves that we have invalidated time, and we're going to leave. We're going to live with and sit with anger and resentment for the things that this partner, this person we loved, did to us. Those are bad results. Those are bad things to take to walk away with. Obviously, it's part of it. You're going to sit with it for a while, but if you don't deal with that, if you stay in that place of anger. You're letting him destroy you. You're letting his mental health issues destroy you. And it is our choice when we have been treated badly to decide what we're going to do with that. I'm choosing not to let it break me forever. Change me, yes. Break me forever? Absolutely not. Now, I think establishing boundaries in a situation where mental health issues are on the table is really important. Um, and, and easier said than done. When you're in the midst of this, nothing is clear. Nothing is linear. Everything is just um, a swirling mess of, of psychic debris, really, <laughs> if you think about it. What advice would you give somebody who finds themselves in a, a difficult situation like that, involving alcohol or not, what are the, some of the things you need to do for yourself? Yeah. 
Uh, you're absolutely right that in the midst of the craziness, one of the things that we lack is perspective. We can't step away from the pain. We can't step away from the drama, the trauma, the how do I get through it, the 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 anger, the the just flood, the the whirlwind of emotions. But without perspective, we stay stuck. We stay in pain. I think the most important thing that any individual can do in the midst of pain is to stay is to take steps to try to find perspective. Whether that is a therapist that you speak to, whether that is a journal where where you are writing down every ugly thought that you have, not with any purpose, but what, what these things do is they help us with perspective or talk to a trusted friend if you have one that you feel safe with. Have a mechanism to get the garbage out because we can't see clearly. And the, and the things that therapy does for you, the things that, and journaling and talking to someone else, provided they're the right person, is that they can help you see through someone else's eyes. They can help you understand the trajectory of your story. Journaling wasn't part of what I did in the worst of it. Journaling is something that I came to later. And I was journaling for no purpose other than my own. I have to get this out of me. And some days it was just ugly rant. I hate this man. I hate this man. I I hate myself. But what what it did over time is it, and I was in therapy too, but what it did over time is it showed me the trends. It showed me the themes of what I kept coming back to, where I was stuck. And these are things that are immensely important. And that, that, that carries over when you're in the midst of the pain. And it carries over as you move out to whatever ending is going to be, whether it is a partner that gets sober or a partner that you have to leave. That perspective is the essential thing to healing. You can't have much of it in the middle of the trauma. Perspective is gained little by little, slowly over time, as you trust yourself again and trust your own emotions and trust who you are in the moment because we can't see ourselves. I think that is so true. You know, I have a... um uh, an excerpt from your book I have to read. I, I read it and I wept and I laughed simultaneously. And it's about identity. And you, you got together with a friend of yours and you wrote, we spoke of identity, responsibility, and self-respect. In other words, just an average lunch for two women when the foundation has collapsed under their feet. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, really good friends. Um, we, you know, women in particular, we go deep. You know, we can lay bare these experiences when we're safe, when we feel safe with someone. And these are experiences you may not, women may not have had the exact same experience I had, but it is something that in, in some ways many of us have parts of. It does not have to be addiction. It does not have to be infidelity. But there are things there that we can relate to is our personal identity, our trauma, our giving for of ourselves to others as we try to navigate life, we try to navigate relationships, we try to navigate our families. And this process of sharing this trauma is something I think women can do really well. And if we're smart about it, it can become a huge part of our healing, finding people that we can say the things to, we can really share our truth with, because they're going to then tell you their stories too. And that's an interesting aspect to being a woman. And it's a really interesting aspect for me as someone now telling my story is that people I didn't know were going through 
some things that were similar who want to share, now it's safe to tell my story too, because I've identified you as someone safe. You know what this is like. And that shared safety is something women do really well when we can find the other, when we can find that place to let it go. And, and this becomes part of our foundation of healing. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.